Alright, Caleb coming down in three, two. Welcome back, SEC Media Days. Coverage brought to you by WorkTrucksLLC.com. That's WorkTrucks with an X, LLC.com. And our friends at Volunteer Automotive Group, go to BallAuto.com, BallAuto.com. We're joined by Greg D. Armand of 97.7 The Zone in Huntsville, ESPN's affiliate. Greg, thanks for taking the time. It's true. But yeah, absolutely. Drew would be a better name to call you, and and I'm Bob. Bob, no, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Drew. Uh, my, no, no worries, man. My apologies. I've been called worse, but no, it's great to be with you, Dave, and uh, great to talk some Alabama. It's been a huge day today for the Tide and a new era of Alabama football uh, with uh, Nick Saban being gone after 17 great years. But the Kalen DeBoer era is underway, and uh, we're excited. Well, let me ask you about that. So the expectations, chances are that Kalen DeBoer is not going to be Nick Saban, right? right? Right, But what are fair expectations? Well, in year one, I think fair expectations are to get to the college football playoff um, and be in contention for the SEC championship. Uh, can they win it? Yeah, if things fall right. But even if they don't, getting to the college football playoff, I think, with this roster, winning 10 games, I know it's a very difficult schedule. Uh, with some, some, you know, a road trip to Tennessee, going to be difficult. We saw what happened two years ago. Road trip to Norman, Oklahoma, right before the Iron Bowl. Uh, even a tricky one early, week three against Wisconsin, uh, and Luke Fickle, who I have a lot of respect for, that's a tricky one too. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's always going to be tough, even at home, Georgia, the Bulldogs probably have the best roster in the league. And then Missouri, who I think is a dark horse SEC championship and playoff contender, that'll be another tough game for Alabama. It's a, it's a difficult schedule, but it's manageable. Drew, you, you shared a story, and we were just at the uh, lunch uh, area, and I overheard it, and I was hoping you could share it with, with my listeners and viewers, and that is why Nick Saban may have decided to retire, and it had to do with assembling a staff, you were saying, as much as anything. Can you kind of relay that to my listeners? Sure. Um, you know, Coach Saban was trying to make some adjustments, he, and if you know it, uh, Dave, he he – in 17 years, never brought back the same staff. So he was always having to lose guys at either coordinator positions, sure. head coaching jobs. So he was always losing coaches. But, you know, as, as time has gone on, he's 72 years old, and he had told Greg Byrne, you know, at, at the end of last year, I'm, this is going to be a year-to-year -year thing. And so that gets out in coaching circles. And so he – and I think – Greg Byrne, the athletic director. Yes, the athletic director, Greg Byrne. And I, and I think a big part of it, too, and your listeners will, will know this about backwards and forwards, was that – Jeremy Pruitt, after his issues with the NCAA, wasn't is not in coaching right now on the college level or in the non professional leagues and at the high school level at Plainview High School and back in his hometown in, in Alabama. He wasn't going to be able to uh, get that. Said, Coach Saban couldn't get Pruitt back. Pruitt, uh, he and Kirby Smart were the two best he ever had to do it. And I still and he spent a lot of time. Coach Saban did the year before trying to get Pruitt back because they thought he would be cleared potentially, and maybe through his lawyer they could work out a deal with the NCAA and, and be back to Alabama. But it didn't happen. And and once he wasn't able to bring him back, you know Kevin Steele was brought in. But Coach Steele, Tennessee, very familiar with him, a Tennessee alum, a guy that's coached at Tennessee, coached all over the SEC. He it became obvious when they hired him late that he was only going to be a one-year guy. I mean, I thought when he signed the three-year contract he'd at least coach two of them because I thought Coach Saban would keep going. But, you know, Coach Steele decided he wanted to retire. That, you know, For a lot of these old school guys, the NIL, the transfer portal, they just don't want to deal with it. And so Coach Steele had a great career, decides to hang it up. And so he knew Traverius Robinson wasn't defensive coordinator material. He had been a defensive coordinator at Florida and South Carolina. But I think, you know, from what I've understood, last year they tried to give T-Rob more responsibility. But it just was there was a lot on Coach Saban's plate, and, uh, and Kevin Steele just didn't have the energy to keep going, and he knew after the season I've got to find a DC, and because he just it was just one of those things where look you know T Rob's a great recruiter, a great secondary guy, but he's not a defensive coordinator, and he wanted T Rob to stay in that role, but T Rob wanted to be a DC, you know, wanted to you know continue to uh, and, and move up the ladder, and also you know we, word started to leak out T Rob wasn't sure Coach Saban was going to continue to be there. He's like, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to commit to something long term because, again, I don't know if you're going to be here. And so he tried to reach out. He tried to hire Bo Davis. Same thing. And I mean, Bo and Coach Evan have a very good relationship. But, you know, Bo was like, Coach, I, I love you, but I don't know how long you're going to be there. And so it was just becoming very hard to put a staff together. I can see that. And Pruitt was part of it. So I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you telling me that if 
if Jeremy Pruitt was available, didn't have the NCAA issues, that Nick Saban might still be that oh, coach. Oh, I think there's a great chance. Because, really? Because wow. I just think Jeremy, if you go back and look at the run Jeremy had under coach when he took over after uh, Kirby left in 2015, 16, 17, 16 was his most talented team that didn't win it. And, and three key injuries, Bo Scarborough, Sean Dion Hamilton, Eddie Jackson kind of derailed that. But they had a great team. They won it all in 17, and then Jeremy came to Tennessee. So, uh, but I just think that he, he, and don't forget, the first high Nick Saban ever had at Alabama was Jeremy Pruitt. He hired him from Hoover High School to be the first analyst that nobody had ever heard of. Nobody, we didn't have analysts back then. And we all had like 1,500. Yeah, so he hired him in an off-the-field role. So they had a very good relationship, very close relationship, and I still believe if he could have brought in Pruitt and hadn't had to take on as much, so much of a heavy load defensively, I still think there's a chance he might have stayed because I just think that uh, it, it, he had a hard time because Pete Golding, he tried to mold Pete into the same kind of guy that he did with Muschamp at LSU, mm -hmm. Kirby, and, and Pruitt. But I just don't think, and, and we'll see, he's going to get a shot at Ole Miss this year because Pete, they got a great roster. A lot of people think they're going to make the playoff. I don't think Pete's elite. And I think, you know, he wanted to keep Groom and Pete, but Pete wanted decided he wanted to go elsewhere. And I think they felt like he felt like he'd had five years of Saban. It's not easy to work for him. And so I think uh, Nick, Coach Saban wanted to go back to what he's familiar with. That's Jeremy Pruitt, and he couldn't get it. And I just – what I mean by that is I think it was the first domino in – the thing that kind of led to him retiring because Jeremy Pruitt knows his system backwards and forwards and he knew how to, uh, you know, adapt it. He even, sim he was the first one to get Coach Saban to simplify it when he was there in 16 and 17. So not being able to bring Jeremy back, I think was the first in, in a few dominoes that fell uh, that ultimately drove Nick Saban to retire. But, you know, the way it's all worked out, I, I think it's been worked out beautifully for Alabama because Greg Burns, a great athletic director, he had a plan. He knew, you know, months ago that this could happen. So he was prepared. He had a list. And so they were able to execute the search and get Kelly on the board. Well, and that's something I was going to lead to. You you said that you had heard back in October to keep an eye on Kalen and DeBoer. I could argue Kalen and DeBoer is a great hire. I could argue he's a bad hire. Fine. But the point is, it was obvious that Alabama knew who they wanted from the get and that was a very intent coaching search of getting one guy I thought correct me if I'm wrong which is about the opposite of what a lot of Tennessee coaching searches have been <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I would agree I mean I've been through some Alabama coaching searches that weren't very well executed uh, but but Greg Byrne is the best athletic director Alabama's ever had in my opinion and he he, his, he was the son of an athletic director he knows how it works and and I think the difference is like uh, even when coach Bryant retired and Ray Perkins was chosen uh, the, 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 the structure and alignment is so strong at Alabama right now with Stuart Bell, the, the president, and then the athletic director, Greg Byrne. And, you know, when you look at Nate Oates, and you, you follow basketball just like football in, in Tennessee, and Rick Barnes done a great job. But if you – Nate Oates could have left four or five times. And if, if the AD wasn't as good as Greg Byrne at getting him what he needs and getting boosters to step up and – and, to, and give him NIL money and, and facility upgrades, then I'm telling you, then, then Nate Oates would have left. Because he could have gone to Michigan a couple times. He could have gone to Kentucky. He took his name out early. He could have, I mean, he could have gone to Louisville twice. But they're giving him what he wants. And so he's been staying. And so that's that's really huge. Because Tennessee looks like they're on that path right now with Danny White. That's why Tony Vitello, who just won a national championship, trust me, Tony Vitello could have gone to Texas. He could have gone to Texas A&M. He could have gone to LSU. He's, a, he's the most wanted man in college baseball probably right now, but he stayed because they're giving him the upgrades he wants. They're giving him the leeway to run the program that he wants. And I think Danny White's done a great job as athletic director and is making him comfortable. And if you have a strong athletic director, that's a lot of times when you see coaches move, and especially at, uh, in multiple sports at a school, it's because you don't have the alignment in the president's office and the AD's office where they're comfortable in being there. And I think that's why Tony Vitello stayed and uh, won a national championship this year at Tennessee. And that's why Alabama, I think, has the best roster of coaches that they've had in athletics-wise across the board in a long time. Drew to Armand, how do we follow your work, sir? Uh, it's at Drew D 977 ESPN. Uh, my station is 977 ESPN in Huntsville, and we host Talking Ball with Scott Tyson and myself, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. And uh, we always enjoy the conversation. We thank you for the opportunity to connect with your listeners. Yeah, it's great stuff. We appreciate that. More brought to you by our good friends at Work Trucks and Volunteer Automotive, Automotive Group, live from Dallas, Texas. SEC Media Days off the export. 
That was Drew Diarmond with Dave Hooker, and I just thought that was some explosive information. So it sounds like Nick Saban would have stayed if he could have gotten staff members on one-year deals, which he could have gotten Jimmy Pruitt on, but Jimmy Pruitt's violations at Tennessee calls the show calls, which forced Nick Saban to look elsewhere because the NCAA wasn't going to let him hire Jimmy Pruitt. The reason that stands out to me, too, is because of the extra work Nick Saban had to do last year with the staff. That is true. What's untalked about, and I've talked about this, is it being Nick Saban's best coaching job ever, was that he pretty much took over the offense in week four and simplified it and forced Jalen Morrow back in as a starter and said, we're going to be a first read and run guy. I'm going to run the offense while he also had to run the defense because he couldn't get Jeremy Pruitt there. If he could have had Jeremy Pruitt there and had a little bit less, had not had to focus on everything, we might have had a bit of a different story. That's a very intriguing insight by Drew D. Armand.